Greetings, adventurers, and welcome back to the Den of the Drake. Other dragons hoard gold while I hoard internet cringe. So the world of RPGs is always expanding and diversifying in new and terrifying ways. But I've never been one to let change. Are you done watering my plants? Oh, thank God you picked up. Something's going on in the basement and the cops won't answer any of the calls I make from the office phone. You wouldn't know anything about that, would you? And then she said, This isn't about good or bad, it's about power in a f***ing Star Wars show. It's definitely gonna bomb. Sir, it doesn't matter how much you disliked the Acolyte trailer, that's not what reporting a bomb threat means. Okay, I'll be right down. All right, this better be good, you little- Oh my, poltergeist! I'll call a priest. A demon? The office is being haunted by a demon. I thought the building was too cringe for anything paranormal to get in. Well, according to my pocket necronomicon, demonic forces can enter any space if they buy enough information from a data broker. A data broker? Oh yeah, the demon throwing around all our stuff probably bought our information online. Full names, emails, home addresses, health records, our relatives, and apparently our office building. This is an ad, isn't it? Yeah, it's an ad. Have you been getting a crap ton of scam calls, texts, and emails? That's because every day, data brokers get rich selling your data to spammers and scammers looking to target you. That's why I use the sponsor of today's video, Aura. Aura scours the darkest corners of the internet to find which data brokers are selling your personal information, and then submits opt-out requests on your behalf, which, under penalty of law, the data brokers have to abide by. Check this out. I used Aura to see what data brokers were caught selling my info, and it was way more than I was comfortable with. Especially since the information they found can be used to gain access to sensitive stuff like bank and social media accounts. Plus, I haven't gotten a single spam call since I had Aura opt out for me. Okay, that's great and all, but what do we do about the demon? Well, I've been waiting to call in a favor from a priest buddy of mine. Ah, speaking of which, did someone call a data priest? Wait a minute, a few weeks ago, Aura was a weirdly muscular cube and the best cybersecurity hub on the market, but now he's a priest? Believe it or not, but there's a pretty large amount of overlap between parasitic demons and data brokers. Okay, that's fair. Oh, vile demon, what is it you want with this YouTuber? <laughs> Revenge? Wait a minute, I know what's going on here. This isn't a demon at all. It's the- Ooh, Suck on this phantasmal dick. The, the wizard? wizard? But why? Why would you choose to haunt our office? You shot me in the face with a rocket in the last aura ad. In what world would that not piss me off? Now prepare to be mildly inconvenienced for the rest of your mortal lives. Larry! There is no Larry anymore. Only vengeance! Ha! <laughs> Not if Aura has anything to say about it. Come on, Father Aura. God wants you to kill the wizard again. The power of Aura compels you. You may have bought your way in using a data broker, but Aura is much more than just an anti-data broker tool. I am an antivirus software, a fully functional VPN, a password management tool, and a parental control hub to protect your children from skibbity brain rot and much much more plus i come with one million dollars in identity theft insurance and in the fact that i only cost a tiny fraction of what all these softwares cost individually and you got yourself one vanquished wizard ghost on a budget prepare for my ultimate attack yes hello yeah i got one of yours <laughs> All right, you pointy-hatted freak. You've been a very naughty boy, and now it's time for Daddy Lucifer to give you a spanking. Wait! I want to sign up for Aura. It's the best cybersecurity hub, and getting a free trial via Drake's affiliate link is the best way to support the channel. No! And here's my bill. What the... I thought you said you were cheap. Oh, I am. I'm one of the most budget-friendly and reliable cybersecurity options on the market. But the exorcism stuff is more of a side hustle. See you around, buddy. Oh, so 
How much for the exorcism? How many kidneys you got left? <sighs> you can water your own plants from now on, Drake. I value my privacy and I value yours too. Click the link in my description or go to aura.com slash den of the Drake to get two weeks of aura protection for free. It's by far the best way to support my channel, so if you like my content and being safe online, be sure to give Aura a try. Link is in the description. Well, now that the paranormal activity has been dealt with and I've conveniently found a kidney to sell on Craigslist, I think it's time for an RPG horror story, don't you? So if you're in the RPG sphere, you've probably heard of Vampire the Masquerade. For the uninformed, it's an RPG where you play as a dark, brooding creature of the night with a thing for lust, power, and control. Personally, I've never played it, but I'm sure the counterculture metalhead inner child of mine would probably force me to let out a pretty unmanly squeal of joy at the thought of roleplaying as a vampire. But that's the thing, dear listener. A game where you play as a dark, brooding creature of the night with a thing for lusty overtones tends to attract real-world creatures of the night with things for lusty overtones. The story I have for you today stars a player whose blood courses with an ancient and terrible Terrible evil! No, I'm not talking about the curse of vampirism, I'm talking about the curse of being a simp! Also, he's kinda racist, because why not? Now, without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive right into the horrifying world of r slash RPG horror stories. Enjoy. This week's story comes from Reddit user Techscrub Priest and is titled Vampire the Masquerade and the Simpening. Let me tell you a tale of the first two sessions of the Vampire the Masquerade 5e game I'm running. Let's clear the air here that yes, the memes can be true, and yes, this game can bring out the worst people out of their hidey hole. But most of my group are good players with actually interesting stories to them. And then there's one player that almost got murked session one, and then got the whole party in trouble in session two. Our cast will be me the storyteller, the La Sombra French resistance fighter, the venture businessman with more money than God, the gangrel prima donna that owns a brothel slash nightclub, and the Katif former cholo ganger. Katif being our problem child for this story. There are two other characters that will be mentioned in passing, but they weren't really affected by the proceedings. They'll be referred to as the brothers. The story starts with each player getting a personalized letter from a mysterious benefactor asking them all to come to the North Carolina Research Triangle. Due to a major innocent, the benefactor thinks that putting new players on the board might stabilize all the discourse that's going on. La Sombra is tasked by his maker to go because of a debt. Venture goes because of the possibility for grabbing power. Gangrel is there to hide away from her abusive sire that treats her like a doll. And Katif is there to get info on the killer of his dead brother. Now for those not in the know, La Sombra, Venture, Katif, and Gangrel are all types of vampires that you can play. Each having their own powers and weaknesses that make them interesting. And the older a vampire is, the stronger their vampire powers are. Keep that in mind because it does get brought up. The Coterie, Vampire Party, finds themselves getting picked up from an airport in a limo. Gangrel is already in it since she got there a year ago and kept in a safe house. The second people to show up are La Sombra and Venture, since La Sombra works as a sort of bodyguard for Venture. The brothers come in and do their thing. Then, Katif comes in. Now, he was made as a pretty brash and combative character, spec to the nines as someone who could dish out and take damage at level one. But this is where things go south. Katif proceeds to walk up to the valet and point a gun towards him, and asks what he knows about his brother and his killer. Now, I don't know what he was thinking since this guy was clearly just a driver, not the benefactor, and why it was a good idea to pull a gun out at an airport. La Sombra and Venture act quick blocking the view out of sight of normal people, but this is where the first instance of simping happens. The gangrel, the only woman in our player group, proceeds to try and calm the Katif down, and she was about to make a roll for it, but then... Uh, this. He doth calm down, seeing the beautiful woman in the limo. The flags have been raised, boys. This was an utter grinding halt to all the aggression, and this wasn't the first time that this was going to happen. With the jarring intro out of the way, they get in the limo and are driven off into what seems to be the middle of the research triangle, to what seems to be a private psychiatric facility. 
They are led to a pair of double doors that bar off the owner's office. Inside, they find an older gentleman with wizened hair, a tweed suit, and black veins on his hands. He welcomes them all to his home and is glad to see that they all got his letters. He goes into further detail on how he needs them to find some research that all the head honcho vampires were working on that disappeared after something or someone killed them all in a bloody display. The triangle is split up between three cities. Raleigh, Chapel Hill, and Durham. Now that each of their leaders were dead, Vampire Society is in a tizzy. The group was asking questions and trying to get a better grasp of the situation, except our boy, the Katif. Katif proceeds to stomp his way to the old man and draws his gun on him, getting up in his face. Listen here, puta. You give me where my brother's killer is, or I'm gonna make you see the Holy Ghost. He may have been going for this kind of religious shtick. I don't know, man. Okay, make me a willpower test. He gives me a weird look as I ask him this and gives the roll, netting him four successes in total, but it wasn't enough. You feel your body move on its own accord, lock stepping back to the only open seat available next to Gangrel. This is where they learned that they were dealing with a very old vampire. The Katif tries to protest this whole thing when the Gangrel starts to chastise him for trying to start things. He clams up and acts like a whipped dog. As the quest giver gives them lore and such, everyone is interacting and the brothers are making comments about robbing people in suits. Of course, this causes the Katif to chomp at the bit, saying that his character is motioning at the quest giver to the brothers as if asking if they should kill him. Man, let's kill this old f her. He's not telling me any information, despite him saying that he had it. He proclaims as he gets back on his feet. Three things happen in this moment. Venture is trying to businessman talk things down to get him to calm down. Lissambra, on the other hand, is getting ready to stealth kill him because he sees that the Katif is a huge compromise to clearing his debt. But before that all could happen, the old man finally stops being nice. In the blink of an eye, he appears in front of Katif and grabs his face in his hands, an encroaching madness invading his mind, telling him to shut up and to stop acting like a child instead of like the creature of the night that he is. His point made once more, he lets go and proceeds to give the PCs their lodgings. Venture gets a corporate skyscraper, La Sombra gets a row house, the brothers a ranch, and the Gangrel her club. Of course, the Katif begs the Gangrel to live with her, offering to work as a bouncer at the club. The Gangrel's player, being a tad too nice at character creation, did offer to let him stay there, so the character agrees. And thus, the first major step to a major shit show is born. I'll stop there. Tell me if you guys are interested in the second session. This post is getting a bit too long for my tastes. Man, let me tell you, it took every fiber of my being not to do a super over-the-top Tuco Salamanca accent for this character. I got so many Spanish-speaking people in my life that I'm starting to pick up the accent and the vernacular by osmosis. But just because I could doesn't mean I should, guys. Why? Because behind the cartoon dragon, you already know I'm whiter than paper. I'm talking directly to my IRL Mexican homies who I know are going to be giving me shit once this video uploads, by the way. I could give a f what the terminally online white savior complex people think. Now before you fly to my comment section to champion these poor defenseless Latin X people I've forcefully befriended against their will, ask yourself one question. How many times have you been invited to the carne asada? Yeah, that's what I thought. Pendejo. Anyways, back on topic. If you're a veteran DM, you have definitely seen this character before. The wannabe badass who goes against the grain of society and uses violence and intimidation to get what they want, and tends to get pretty butthurt when their level 3 character turns out to be not that intimidating to anyone who could bench more than two plates. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with a character who sometimes resorts to intimidation tactics to get what they want, but when every single roleplay interaction ends with a gun being pointed in the NPC's face? Well, that's when the inherent selfishness of bringing a character like this becomes pretty clear. A character that immediately escalates an interaction to threats of violence completely undermines all of the other characters that they share a table with. 
All the other characters who may have wanted to interact with this NPC are now forced to have their interactions flavored by the actions of another player. Not to mention the fact of what happens when the NPC calls Pencil Dick's bluff and decides it's time to throw down. If your DM plays NPCs in the way that actual humans behave, there are going to be a few who react to threats of violence with violence. And if your DM goes by American rules, a decent amount of those NPCs are going to have 7 to 15 rounds of f you packed into a holster on their hip. In role playing games, combat is where characters live and die. And depending on your DM, combat may or may not be something that you want to avoid at all costs. I'm not trying to get my squishy wizard stabbed in the neck trying to buy owlbear food for the druid, thanks. Now, using threats of violence and intimidation tactics is by no means wrong in the context of an RPG. Some of the best characters in fiction are some of the scariest motherfuckers by design. But Batman's not beating the hell out of the guy at 7-Eleven when he goes to buy a Slim Jim. My advice is to save the menace for more dramatic scenes where it's warranted. Not only is it going to make it so that you're not stepping on other players' toes, but it's also going to have a lot more of an impact when your normally stoic character lets the mask slip and reveals the monster that's hiding underneath. Instead of the puffed up man child who just watched the first season of The Punisher and thinks that he and his man titties are as scary as John Bernthal. God, I miss that show. I had a good bit of reception to the first part. Even Gangrel read it and said it sent a shiver down her spine. Second session started a week in game time after meeting with the benefactor. Each player got their situation together and so far everything started out smooth, compared to the first one being sandpaper. Lasombra had been contacted by one of the need to know people in Chapel Hill, earning the job of taking out a pompous mafia family that she sees as an eyesore. Venture got a visit by a vampire mage that used his own skyscraper but gave it to the old man to repay a debt. His side quest was to look into the trouble in Little China. The brothers have werewolf neighbors. And finally, we find Gangrel and Katif getting a personal visit from the impromptu leader of Durham. Did you hear that record scratch yet? Because this is where things go from 0 to 100 in one night. Now Durham is in Anarch country one of the factions of Vampire Society. Currently, the leader is masterfully settled in as the police chief of the city. This man has a presence in both local government and leading the vampires of Durham with an iron fist. So it's no surprise that the former Cholo Katif has a bit of an issue with the police. And one of his flaws is that the police don't like him in kind. Our boy comes up to this man who stands close to seven feet tall and looks like Arnie during his Conan career and tries to start beef. Damn, son, I didn't think we allowed pigs in my lady's club. He said something to this approximation. The chief looks down at him and sighs, informing him that he's just making a house visit because his therapist, the old man, asked him to. So could he kindly take him to the owner of the club? All right, but if you do anything fishy, you're going to meet the Holy Ghost. With that, him and the chief reach the private floor where Gangrel and her familiar live. She is currently feeding a large 8 foot long albino alligator named Bambino a mix of meat and her blood when they arrive. The chief is just ignoring the angry wannabe ganger behind him as he exchanges words with Gangrel. He does the greetings and welcomes to the city. Gangrel is trying to get on the good foot of the chief, so the story progresses and the chief is led out by Katif, who acts like a spoiled child, but actually admits that he respects the chief for putting up with his attitude. The next night is the first time I make the players roll for how hungry they were. Everyone except Katif passes, so the rest get one extra hunger while he is stuck on one. Fun fact, in Vampire the Masquerade version 5, they added a mechanic where you pick out how your character feeds. La Sombra has to eat the organs of his victims. Venture has to drink the blood of his business staff. Gangrel feeds with those she sleeps with. And finally, Katif feeds from animals. Dogs, to be precise. Hey man, I'm f***ing hungry. I need a chihuahua to eat. Mind you, he just said this out loud in front of normal people. Big thing in this game. The normals aren't supposed to know you're a vampire. Things like vampire hunters come around if that rumor gets spread. Before all this began, Gangrel had wrote up a letter for the Coterie members and was having her most trusted working girl delivering it. Of course, the girl's first stop is Katif, and she hands him the letter a few minutes after his first mistake. 
Dang, man. I didn't know my mistress was working on something like this. He then stares as he leans over the girl and looks at her. Do you know what we are? That me and Gangrel, my fire, are kindred? The vampire word for vampire. This. This whole thing has me cringe to the point where I had to turn off my mic and yell, only to turn it back on and explain to the player that you aren't supposed to do any of this. I think that this was a heat of the moment thing mixed with the simpage going on that he called Gangrel his maker. This is false. I had the girl play it off, not knowing what any of that meant, and having to deal with Johns on the daily, so proceeds to continue with her delivery. Not understanding what he had just done, the player asked me something that just snowballed into disaster. I want to find a dog to eat. Can I find an animal shelter that's open? I inform him that it's 12.30 and that no shelters are open this late. He still proceeds to roll to find something to eat, and rolls a bestial success. The monster inside is present in the roll, pushing him to go on based off of instinct alone. I inform him that, as he goes around the neighborhood, he finds a stray dog down an alley. Now here's a question for you. What does he do with this info? Does he A. Take the dog back to the club to privately drain it B. Look around to see if anyone was around before going for it C. Decide that he doesn't really need to eat and maybe secure himself a safer way to get food Or D. YOLO He proceeds to throw caution to the wind and attacks the dog and he does say that he is a messy eater. All this carnage is met with a passing couple coming across him and screaming about what he's doing. Not one to let things go unwasted, he proceeds to pull out his infamous Holy Ghost and uses it to attempt to intimidate them with it in order to forget everything that they just saw. He even showed off his vampire ability by making his eyes go beast-like to get a bonus. He rolls and gets a bestial failure. He crit fails and the monster exposes itself in full glory. He does succeed in intimidating the couple, but he fails to see the friend with a smartphone recording everything. He has exposed himself. He has been caught bloody and on camera. He does the one smart thing. He runs. Mind you, I am rolling for if the NPCs are catching up to him. Yes, I seem like an ass, but I will not fudge rolls. He is caught nearly immediately by a police officer on a bike. Now I rolled to see who this was, and lo and behold, it's the chief second in command. Another need to know NPC that the party was told about. She informs him to freeze and to get on his knees. He begins to argue, but he sighs and does so. It seemed like he was actually doing something smart, but he gave me a look that said otherwise. As the second came up to him, she smelled the air and growled. The second in command. Ah, oh, damn it, you're a kindred, aren't you? Come on, asshole, we gotta get you to the chief. Hearing the name of his hated chad of an officer rival, he begins to feign his compliance. Okay, officer, but I just want you to know, I'm not the one dying today. This starts an epic fight between a level 1 vampire and a vampire police officer with status. She proceeds to use her vampire powers to stun his brain and paralyze him by putting a stake in his heart. Strike one for horror movie lore. The other players were going wild. La Sombra, who is my roommate IRL, is screaming his head off in his room because this whole situation has taken 80% of our playtime and he hasn't been able to do anything. The brothers are laughing their goddamn heads off, and Gangrel is hiding her cringing the best she can, and Venture is just slamming his head on his desk. Cut to the club where Gangrel is informed that the chief is there. He looks mad, and he tells her that, your boy f***ed up, get in the car. They proceed to drive to the station's underground parking lot where they find Katif in front of 12 supposed vampire cops, bound and gagged. The chief lists the sins of the past few hours and how there's going to be a hell of a lot of things to clear up. What does he have to say for himself? Man, you don't know who you're messing with. Me and my coterie are going to take control of man. We are here to kill the Baron man. The player had not been paying attention. The chief is the Baron of Durham. He had just dragged his coterie into a massive shit show along with him. Just before he's about to get ashed by a pissed off vampire tank, Gangrel makes her plea. Her and I don't want to kill a character the second session of a game, but I can't let this go without any consequences. Chief, in an angry country voice. Mm. 
All right, I won't ask the fresh lick, but your whole coterie owes me a major boon. He is never allowed back in my city or he will be ashed. And you? He points at Gangrel. Are going to drink my blood for a bond. Major boons in Vampire the Masquerade are no joke. Pretty much, you gotta do anything for someone, even at the cost of your life. And a blood bond is even nastier. Pretty much, if you drink another vampire's blood, you become addicted to it. It mentally changes your disposition about the person you drink from, and if you do it three times, you're hooked and devoted permanently. Thanks to Gangrel's background, this was close to the worst thing ever to happen to her. To escape the iron grip of her maker only to be bound to another man was something that she would never let go. She takes the deal, and Katif freaks out, dropping the n-word a couple of times in character. Player is an African American saying this in the heat of the moment. The group meets. La Sombra tries to, and fails to stake Katif. And it is decided that they will hide him at the ranch with the brothers on his own. At the end of the session, I was informed that Gangrel has put a hit out on Katif along with La Sombra. And now, I just have to wait and see what unfolds. End of story. Huh. You know, normally I don't really whine about this kind of thing, but the constant racial stereotyping from this guy started rubbing me the wrong way in part two. Now, I've already said it before, but I am a firm believer that someone is allowed to play a character of a different race in the same vein that voice actors are allowed to portray characters of different ethnicities than their own. But only if that portrayal is designed to honor the ethnicity being portrayed. Bangers like, I'm going to make you meet the Holy Ghost, and I need to go eat a chihuahua, make me think that this guy's portrayal maybe was not in the best faith. To be honest, it reads a lot more like this guy chose Mexican as his race in the same way a D&D &D player would choose orc or dwarf. And I know that I am not the only one who thinks that's kind of f***ed up. TLDR, homie is not getting invited to the carne asada anytime soon. Now I know what you're thinking. Okay, so the guy is a selfish role player and has a thing for racial stereotypes, but this story was called Vampire the Masquerade and the Simpening. But I didn't see a whole lot of simping happening here. Well, you see, dear listener, Gangrel herself decided to show up in the comments and add a bit more context to the title. Let's go ahead and dive into that, shall we? I'm said Gangrel. The simp part is him literally telling me that I could command him and that the only way his character was calm at any given time was when mine was telling his to be calm. So flash forward to the whole time the Durham chief was informing us that he was going to take the head of this man as punishment for breaching the masquerade as he was insulting him. We took a five minute break and out of character he begged me to command him to shush and call his character my character's dog. I was going to let his character die, but I felt bad, and I wanted to let him try again, especially after ST and he had a talk. But even after saving him, all he did was talk about killing dogs and toss threats willy-nilly. He even went as far as flashing kindred abilities to the girls in my club. Having enough after that, I decided to put that hit out. I can't have my chances at progressing the game and my character secrets tossed out there. I hope that helps explain the simp part. It made the sessions weird and uncomfortable for everyone, and to experience it firsthand was pure cringe. And there it is, the simpening awakens. So the dog thing can be interpreted in one of two ways. Option A is that they wanted to do this kind of badass henchman thing and be a sort of frothing pit bull that can only be kept in check with the right person holding his leash. Given that we know about the way this guy plays, I'm willing to bet that this was probably what he was going for here. But there's also the much more insidious option B. It's a possibility that this dude was simping so hard that he tried to sneak in some sort of Dom sub relationship into the game without Gangrel's consent, which is a whole other level of messed up. Look, I get it. The nine foot tall Resident Evil vampire mommy had the entire internet begging to be whipped for a few months, but control your loins, my guy. Now I wanna give this guy the benefit of the doubt and say that he was probably going for the misunderstood pit bull angle. One, because I wanna have some faith in people, and two, he's already awful enough on his own. But if it is that second option, well, everyone should be prepared to get their wood out. I'm talking about the wooden 
mistakes. Go to your rooms and clean your filthy brain. Ugh, I think it's time for fan art. How about we go ahead and take a look at this week's Gallery of the Drake. This week's fan art comes from viewer Conan Bell, who has put the Drake himself into his card game, which you can pick up yourself using the link in my description. If you guys know anything about me, there are two things that I value above all else. Big guns and big guns. Look at this shifty little bastard. Just looking at that little face tells me how much of a jerk this guy is. Well, well, well. If it ain't Drake cringe score. I didn't think you'd have the stones to show up for the duel. Uh. <coughs> Sir, our duel is at high noon and it is 11.45. Hey, my bad, brother. It was a misfire. Won't happen again. As I was saying, the arm of the law will... You little shit! You're trying to cheat at a duel and you're still missing! Ah, screw you! I still got four bullets in 15 minutes! Thank you again, Conan Bell, for submitting your art. If you'd like to see your fan art featured in Gallery of the Drake, be sure to send it to the email in my About section. Fan art is my favorite part of doing YouTube, and it means the world to me that I can inspire artists like you to create artwork like this. With the story over and artwork displayed, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and send in your fan art. And if you feel like supporting the channel further, my Patreon and merchandise links are in the description. I would like to thank you all for listening, and I hope to see you next time in the Den of the Drake.